Buona tarda. Good afternoon. I'm here to talk about aging, and more specifically, aging of the brain. But not the sort of aging of, you know, when you go old and you go, oh my God, I'm getting old, I don't want to rock and roll anymore. No, no. I want to talk about brain death. You see, I have a friend who claims that she'll be able to live healthily until she is 150 years old. Now, this friend happens to be a medical doctor, so she has a good understanding of human physiology, and she's well informed about the progress of biomedicine. So one would expect her to have good arguments for her optimism. But every time I discuss with her about this, I have to remind her of an ugly fact that goes against her hopes. And that is that our brains age very badly. You see, by the time we are 80 years old, 50% of us, 50% of everybody in this room, will be suffering from some sort of mental disease that will either cripple you, erase our memories, or kill you. So unless we manage to extend the longevity of our brain, it's very difficult to imagine that we can actually live up to 150. And Unlike what's going on in other fields of medicine, such as oncology or cardiovascular medicine, we actually have very little hope today of predicting, preventing, or much less curing brain diseases such as Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, or senile dementia. In fact, neurodegeneration remains a sort of biomedical mystery. We are not very clear about the genetics of these diseases. We don't really know what's the impact of external factors. Uh, and in fact, we don't even understand why neurons tend to get sicker and deteriorate so much, so much more than normal tissues in our body, other tissues in our body. So I'm here to tell you a story that I hope will illuminate some of these questions, and perhaps in due time, offer ways to actually prevent these diseases. And this is not a small claim, but the story is beautiful, so it deserves to be told anyway. It's the story of the convergence of two independent research paths. And this is how science works. Very often, scientists working on apparently different topics will converge to offer answers to long-standing and important questions in an unexpected manner. These two research paths that I'm going to tell you about started 70 years ago, and they only converged very recently. The path on the left is the path that describes the progress of science in understanding a very peculiar uh, neurodegeneration. It's called lithicobodic. Lithicobodic is an endemic disease to a small island in the Pacific Ocean, in the island of Guam. It was first reported by American doctors of the US Army when they reached the island after the Second World War. And they were extremely interested in that disease because it had very peculiar characteristics. I don't see anybody. <laughs> this disease looks like Parkinson's. It's like a combination of Parkinson's and amyotrophic lateral sclerosis. But it has two important differences. The first one is that it affects people very early in their lives, in their 30s or their 40s. And the second important difference is that the incidence of the disease in the island of Guam was 100 times, 100 times higher than that of Parkinson's in Western populations. So doctors were really interested in this disease, and research was strong. This research took an unexpected turn in the 60s and the 70s, after the work of Marjorie Whiting, who was an anthropologist working on the disease. She proposed that the disease was caused by a toxin, a toxin that was present in the food that the local people in Guam were ingesting from a local plant. That was revolutionary, but that toxin was actually found, and it was found to be an amino acid. It's called beta-methyl aminoalanin. 
And research later showed that beta-methylaminoalanine, or BMAA, will actually cause neurodegeneration in animal models such as mice, rats, uh, or monkeys. Now, then it was discovered that beta-methylaminoalanine is not only made by plants, it's actually mostly made by bacteria, bacteria that like to live in coastal shallow waters, very much like the waters that you have here around the Delta de Lebra, near Amposta. Bacteria in these waters produce a lot of BMAA, and when their numbers grow, the waters become contaminated with this amino acid, and the animals will feed on it. And several reports in the 90s have shown that there is a correlation between certain types of neurodegeneration and the physical proximity of the patients to the waters where BMAA is concentrated. So, I think it's clear that BMAA will cause neurodegeneration, but the question was, why? And that was only answered very recently when an Australian laboratory reported that BMAA is, after ingestion, is incorporated into the human body and inserted as a mistake into our proteins. It is what I call a wrong brick. But for you to understand what a wrong brick is, we need to go into the right side of the road, into the right path. It's the path that describes the discovery of the genetic code. Most likely, the most important discovery in science ever made. That path starts also in the 1950s with the work of Franklin, Wilkins, Watson and Crick when they discovered the structure of DNA. That's a fundamental discovery, a phenomenal discovery, because it allowed biologists to understand how did the genetic code work. And the genetic code is nothing else than an alphabet, but it's the alphabet that every single living organism on Earth, every single one, uses to build its genes and its genome. And what is the genome of any species? The genome is nothing else than the book of instructions that the cells of this organism will use to build the proteins that it needs to grow. Then it took us over 25 years to understand how that system worked. Each cell in our body contains a protein synthesis machine, a very sophisticated machine that will read the instructions in the genome and using 20 amino acids as bricks, will build proteins, like if you were building a wall. That's how it works, but it has a big problem. The 20 amino acids that we use as bricks to make proteins are mixed together with a whole bunch of other amino acids that are extremely toxic. If they get into proteins, they are toxic. So the system, somehow, has to manage to pick up the right bricks and exclude the wrong ones. It took us another 20 years to understand how that happens, and this happens thanks to the editing activity, which is something that each cell in the world, again, has to prevent these wrong bricks to get into proteins. Now, nothing here is perfect, and the editing machinery, the editing activity, is not perfect either. It's prepared so that each of our cells rejects the amino acids that we are more in contact with, the more abundant ones around us. But things that we don't see very often might escape the system and get into our proteins. And now you probably see where I'm going with BMAA. BMAA, that amino acid that causes lytic obodic in Guam, is an amino acid that we don't see very often, unless you happen to be in Guam eating like the people in Guam. So the editing system in humans hasn't learned to discriminate against it. It escapes the system it gets into our proteins, and it forces them to collapse. And when that happens, you get neurodegeneration. Okay. So now you think, oh, all right, cool. All I have to do is not go to Guam, not eat like the people in Guam, and I'll be fine. Now, unfortunately, it's not that easy. You see, BMA is only an example, but there are many other examples that we've known for a long time. What you're seeing now is an etching that was made by Francisco de Goya at the end of the 18th century. And it illustrates the effect of a diet that was used at the time, and it is still used today, 
in times of famine. The people in the etching are eating what it's called in Spanish almortas. It's a paste made out of the grit of the seeds of a plant called grass pea. The problem with these seeds is that they contain a high concentration of a very toxic amino acid that will kill your terminal nerves and paralyze your legs in indefinitely. And this is why the woman at the forefront of the image is lying on the floor. You see, and the problem is that apparently the more we look into this, the more we find toxic amino acids with, like this in our diet everywhere. So it's not like you can simply reject some types of uh, food to prevent these amino acids in trend from entering your system. They are everywhere. This is already an incredible realization, but that's likely how things work. Our genetic system is not prepared to filter very small amounts of amino acids. And if they accumulate along our lives, by the time we reach a certain age, they might cause neurodegeneration in the brain. And I'm going to go a step further and propose something even more amazing. This bottle, which is red because my students thought that it would match the carpet, represents the volume of bacteria that we have in our guts. It's about two, vol two liters of, in volume, two kilos in weight. The amount of bacteria in our guts, what's called the microbial flora, is so large that if you consider this an organ in your body, it would be one of the largest organs that we have. It's essential to us. We cannot live with this, without this bacteria. But we know very little about what they produce. And so it's possible, and I think it's very probable, that apart from the toxic amino acids that we can ingest through the food, there is also toxic amino acids that, through our lives, we incorporate because it's, they're produced by these bacteria. So, that's incredible, no? I mean, that's the way it is. No matter how healthy you are, you will not be able to prevent incorporating these wrong amino acids into your system. If you don't live healthily, you'll die earlier, of course, but even if you do as much as you can, your editing system has limitations. Now, if this is true, then the million, not the million, the, the billion dollar question is, what can we do about it? Is there anything we can do about it if this is true? And the answer is absolutely yes. If this is true, there are very simple things that we might be able to do to reduce the problem a little bit. If we manage to identify which amino acids are constantly being misincorporated into our proteins, we might actually simply supplement our diet so that we incorporate into it more of the right amino acids to compete out the wrong ones. Without doing anything dramatic, we might actually be able to reduce the amount of wrong amino acids that end up in our brain. Or, and, as a smart student in my lab actually pointed out, we could actually teach our bacteria, modulate our intestinal flora so that it uh, produces less of these toxic amino acids and it reduces the amount of toxicity that ends up in our neurons. Now, I want to only ask you two things. The first thing is, please, after hearing this talk, don't run to the pharmacy to buy amino acid complements. You'll be wasting your money, and if anything, you'll probably do more harm than good. Science needs to do its job. Figure this out, and if the hypothesis is correct, we can then figure out what, how do we need to manipulate our diet to improve the longevity in our brains. And the second thing I want to ask, it's very simple. By the time you reach your 150th birthday, please go out, celebrate, find the closest scientist to you, and thank him or her for the work that they are doing. Thank you.